dudes, uh, welcome. Uh, you know, recently I've been posting a lot of these paintings of the desert city of Bashar. This is a vanishing desert city. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that I think about when I'm designing a environment concept like this. This is, uh, I consider it concept art, even though it's, it's for an illustration book. This is for the World of Twilight Monk volume two. This is gonna be the next art book that I'm planning to release. It'll be done when it's done, okay? Um, kind of, <laughs> I'm expecting that it'll be finished around, I want to say like January of 2022 is what I'm aiming for, but I might be a little late because one of the things I'm trying to really do is, is make sure that it's as detailed and, and, um, uh, it's just, I want to do the best work of my career with this book. Uh, the next one, every piece that I'm doing recently, I'm, I'm really trying to put that on myself. It's a lot of pressure, but at the same time. I find myself giving myself time to just make it as great as I can. I recently did another video about that as well, but I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the thought process that goes into a piece like this or a, a, a painting, because yeah, you will sometimes be doing paintings like this for concept art. I've designed several desert cities. I designed a lot of Caldium for Diablo three. I designed a desert for uh, a couple of games that didn't quite <laughs> ever come out. I designed some desert uh, cities for an unannounced Riot Games uh, game. I don't know if that'll ever even happen. It was so long ago. But uh, one of the things that I try to think about and, and something that people always ask me about is how do I make my environments feel like lived in worlds that uh, players would want to explore. And um, I want to start from the, the very beginning. Like when you're doing a piece like this, it's so very important that you have your fundamentals down. Uh, and what I mean when I'm talking about fundamentals is like your perspective. Like, can you draw in a three point perspective? Um, if you cannot draw in a three point perspective and make your buildings feel consistent, like they are all part of the same perspective, they are in the same uh, perspective to each other, the same world. And, uh, then you need to go back to the basics. You need to go back to like, um, simple fundamentals. And I've, I've done enough teaching of those, uh, in my easy art lessons and such. And so I won't go into it too much, but you need to have a basic understanding of lighting. Although I don't generally deal with lighting too early on, although my really rough sketch had some lighting in place and you can kind of see it in this, in this image. That lighting should be determined by the mood that you want to evoke, and it should also cluster. Your shadows should cluster together to create large shapes. That's going to give your environment a sense of depth and that, that there's more going on than just the buildings you're seeing. So like in some of these cases, you can see where the light is creating very highly lit areas, and then you've got like shadows clustered together and clumped together, and then uh, the next thing that, of course, you want to consider is your line quality. Now, I I do a little bit more line art kind of a style. That's that's my stylistic choice for my own work. I I don't do this when I'm designing environments for Fortnite or something. Fortnite they don't use any lines in their concept art design. And so they need to see what it's gonna look like as a screenshot in game, like in the art style of the game. And of course, video games don't usually have lines, so you don't draw it with lines. And, and uh, I've been, I've, I've run into that frustration a lot where sometimes lines just tell the best story. Like it, it makes it very clear what you're looking at because the edges are defined. Um, and so pr it's sort of a stylistic preference when I have the luxury of being able to do things in my own comfort zone and my own style and, and the way that I like to present them. But for, you know, whatever project you're working on, you, you have to match the art style of the game that you're working on. And sometimes you're designing that art style, as was the case with, for instance, like League of Legends. And, um, you know, and sometimes it's uh, it's going to go through multiple artists' filters anyway, but you still need to kind of capture the mood and lighting and your time of day. You have to consider that, you know, where is uh, where is the setting? Does it have like a like a uh, overblown light? And, and we're going to address that with some filters and, and layer effects towards the end, which I'll get to. I'll get to that, man. Don't get in too much of a rush. Uh, because early on, it's really just about thinking about the details. And this is this is the meat and potatoes of the video and what I wanted to really talk about, which is how to give it that lived in feel. And um, to do this, 
you really have to consider what life would be like to live in uh, this environment. So if you're living in a really blazing hot desert, you know, you're going to have to have tarps, you're going to have to have uh, structures that are made out of adobe and uh, the kind of materials that you would actually build out of in that desert town. Like they're not going to have a lot of wood, but the, they're going to use wood as accents to nail things into and to tie ropes around because they do have palm trees. You know, they do have some trees out in the desert, but mostly it's going to be like rock uh, shapes, rock formations, and uh, and adobe is going to be most of what things are constructed out of. And then also, uh, you know, patterns on the walls. You know, I did a kind of like an ocean kind of wave pattern because I wanted to, I mean, this is an oasis. I wanted to kind of imply a little bit of like water flow throughout this location. You could see I'm like color dabbing from time to time from another uh, structure, another building that I'm, I'm painting in the environment. So color dabbing from a good source image, I think is helpful to make sure that there's consistency between materials, especially if all of your buildings are made out of the same material. When you're doing something like tensile membranes, for instance, you want to make sure that they feel like believable cloth. Uh, the smaller details such as like tears in the cloth kind of imply a little bit more of like a used worn kind of a history to it. It's not like fresh, perfectly brand new. Uh, it might even be like not necessarily the most wealthy or opulent town, you know, uh, things like that, details like that. Having lots of uh, jars kind of lined up underneath these tarps kind of implies that maybe there's something they wanted to keep a little bit cooler under there or something that might spoil. So maybe they keep fruits or things like that that might get burned up in the sun in those jars. Maybe they keep some kind of liquids or fluids that uh, they're trying to keep a little bit just, you know, out of the direct heat is what I'm what I'm getting at with uh, with that. And then, of course, you know, even everything down to the shapes of the buildings, if you want to make them a little bit more warlike uh, or a more of a fighting uh, race of people or people who live in this village, then you might have to do something where you've got more jagged edges on things or uh, wooden spikes. They wouldn't, well, maybe they would use metal, but I would think that if they're not particularly wealthy, you know, then maybe they would probably use wood, wood spikes, you know, for instance. I personally, I love to have a lot of ropes dangling across walkways, and especially if it's a lived in environment, because you're going to have things where people have things uh, that they're they're hanging clothing that they might hang or you know signs that they might hang for people walking through and things like that now in this particular environment there's not a lot of story to tell this is any old alley in this town it's not meant to be uh, a, a singular building called out because i'm doing call outs of individual buildings and other images for this particular town so uh, I don't have to explain everything in one image and you might not have to also, but if you're doing concept art for a game, you, you're probably going to need your sort of, I don't want to say generic, but your kind of like your uh, general kit. And, and what I mean by that is like the parts, like a modeler could probably look at this piece and um, by the time it's done, you'll see what I mean when I say that a modeler could look at this piece and pull out a lot of different parts to construct many different types of plazas and uh, and maybe even uh, uh, alleyways for a, a town, a uh, desert city, using a lot of these building shapes and uh, a lot of the consistent materials and the kind of construction. So things like having these wooden posts sticking out of the side of the adobe and then having ropes that are wrapped around that to uh, perhaps even send messages between buildings, although that wasn't initially my intent. It was really just to give it a little bit more of a lifelike, aged and worn kind of a, a impact. So the other factor is, of course, the uh, scratches and, and tears and, and um, dings in all the walls. Making everything too perfect makes it look like it's opulent, fresh and prestigious and new. And that's not what I wanted to go for here. I wanted a very humble desert village. Now, a humble desert village isn't going to have, you know, gold filigree pattern work all over everything. This is the biggest mistake that I see a lot of artists doing when they're doing environments is that they'll the story that they're telling is not the story 
that the uh, artwork was intended to, to tell. <laughs> they kind of tend to just fall back on comfort zones or they're just emulating something that they've seen somewhere without really knowing what the purpose was and, and why it's supposed to be shaped that way. I think that's very important. It's, I'm a storyteller at heart. If you follow my channel, you know this about me. Everything's about story to me. If the piece doesn't tell a story, there's no point in making it. That's just my personal philosophy on it. Another thing that I think about that's, I think, probably the most important thing, and <laughs> I can believe I waited till the end to mention this, but you really have to close your eyes and imagine that you're in that space. And what I mean by that is, if you're walking along the platform up on the upper left there, like what happens when you get to the end of that platform? Do you just stop? What's there? What's the point? What's the purpose of that? And every part, every door, every window, every wood post sticking out of the wall should have some kind of function or purpose that indicates what this is used for. And if it doesn't, then at least have a ladder there for the the player. Imagine that you're a person in that world, the NPC, whatever, to climb down. Uh, what would be connecting these buildings, like the, having these walkways, for instance, kind of implies that they need to pass between these buildings for some reason, you know. Uh, having walkways, having pathways, having steps that connect elevations is very important. Having windows, having what kind of window coverings they might have. And why would they even have windows if they don't need them, you know, for example. I would say that you can go one step further with this if you're so inclined and you're very detail oriented to say like, well, what do the patterns on these surfaces even represent and stand for? In, the, in this case, we're seeing the ocean waves kind of because it's meant to be an oasis. It's meant to be like a welcoming location where they, they treasure water, you know, for example. But that's just one instance and one example. But there are other patterns in here as well. What do they mean? What do they imply? Like these windows don't just have little cross shapes, shaped wood things in the windows. It almost looks like maybe it's kind of a spiritual building, you know, and, and what is this building? Is it something that's a little bit more like a, a diner or a food place? It's definitely not because otherwise there would be some kind of like a more welcoming entryway, right? Uh, so things like that, really putting a lot of thought into what message you're sending to the person if they were standing right there. Now, what do you need to get across? You know, if, if this is a specific type of shop, then you should have things, elements in that environment that represent what that's for. If it's a magic shop, yeah, have lots of trinkets and like, you know, cool like, uh, you know, eyes in the symbols, in the, in the really poppy kind of like flyers on the wall that, you know, welcome customers in. If it's meant to be a, a, a like a saloon sort of a place, then have those traditional saloon style doors and a big mug up over the door, like a, and, you know, engraved in wood or something like that. I mean, having the, the story is going to be what's going to give people a reason to stop and look into your world, especially in today's world where it's like, yeah, you want to get some people's attention on Instagram, give them a story to look at. You know, give them something to zoom into, give them a reason to pinch on your artwork and maybe they'll accidentally like it and not realize it. <laughs> yeah, it's a sneaky trick, but you know, uh, if they're engaged enough to look at it, then they owe you a like. I'd say, no, I don't know. that. I don't think anybody owes you a like, but it's all about just creating an engaging piece, creating an engaging world. That's your goal when you're an environment concept artist, when you're designing environments for animation or for a video game, or even if it's just for Instagram or for a comic book or whatever else you're doing. If you have these really inviting worlds that tell stories, then people are going to want to hang around a little longer and the biggest comment that I get when I do environments is people tell me I want to run around in that world. And the way to achieve that is to kind of close your eyes and imagine yourself in that setting and look around and, and what would you see if, if you were at uh, this location? What kind of things might you see? Would you see jugs hanging from, uh, from some of these ropeways? Would you see uh, little streams and waterways in between the buildings? Would you... Uh, would you see little cubbies and, and uh, uh, doors in the alleyways leading into the, the back room of some of these structures? Are they businesses or are they homes? You know, like uh, really try to imagine yourself in that setting and, and try to 
imagine what the people there would want and need. Would they be trading here? Would they be, is this the kind of alleyway where people would have like street brawls or is this the kind of alleyway? Like if there are street ball brawls, then maybe you got to have daggers still sticking out of the walls and things like that. Like every one of those little touches uh, gives this implied story. It's, it's very simple to do if you train your brain to kind of think this way. But um, if you're not thinking this way, maybe try to write it out on paper and try to think about like what visually would represent that kind of a backstory for this setting and location. And then you got a bullet point list and then just go through your drawing and add the bullet points. Now, I could keep going with this piece. I could probably just go on and on and on with more and more stories, even just every balcony, you know? Oh, this is where somebody used to live and maybe they've got bird cages out there or uh, maybe they have a slide down the side or maybe they've got to have a, a, a rail that they can push open like start to think about like how they would move around in that environment and why they would need to move around and and if they have to carry heavy uh, equipment or jugs or something up to those rooftop areas well maybe they have to have pulley systems for example and like you could just keep going <laughs> on and on and layering your story and the more you do that then the more uh the more likely people are to spend a little bit of time wowed by your your environments and it's funny because even as i'm making this video i'm realizing oh man i, I kind of want to keep i want to go back to the piece and keep on adding to it and you know because i don't have a deadline on it that's exactly what i'm gonna do uh, but uh, for now this is what i've got <laughs> i wanted to share it with you uh, thank you so much for stopping by as usual i have art videos here on my youtube channel every wednesday and i do look forward to seeing you next time so uh, i'll catch you in the next video all right ciao Dude, what the heck is Twilight Monk? Which is the first book to buy? I get this question a lot. So I wanted to clarify, if you don't know already, yes, I've worked on many successful video games, but now I'm making illustrated novels and art books. And uh, the order that you should pick them up in if you're interested in the world of Twilight Monk is to start with the book called The World of Twilight Monk. This is an illustrated art book, but it features a lot of backstory on characters and locations and populations and the different cities and what they do with those cities. And this is the, the groundwork for all these adventures that I'm about to tell in the illustrated novels. Now, which illustrated novel should you start with if you want to pick up the Twilight Monk series and start reading about these characters? I highly recommend you start with the the Secrets of Kung Fulio. The Secrets of Kung Fulio has 70 illustrations by myself and Danny Kong. It's a 50,000 word book that was written by myself and Chris Krubick. It has a lot of Kung Fu fantasy adventure action. It is the story of a reluctant teenage hero who has to overcome this bully who's trying to kick him out of town, basically. But he kind of totally stinks at Kung Fu, so he's gonna need to build some alliances and he's gonna need a shortcut to ultra secret Kung Fulio mastery. It's got comedy, it's got action, it's got uh, it's a buddy story too so lots of heart oh, just read the reviews man people are loving this book and yes the illustrated novel series is a series in fact so uh, you can look forward to the return of the ancients which is coming out in illustrated form later this year you can pick up the world of Twilight Monk and secrets of Kung Fulio as well as many of the other comic books and illustrated novels that I've written and drawn over at AquaticMoon.com. All orders are delivered and fulfilled by Amazon, so you can read reviews and get that prime shipping, baby. I can't wait to share these Kung Fu adventure stories with you, and I hope you'll come along for the ride. I'd love to read your reviews as well. So dudes, that's it for me on this one. I'll catch you in the next video. A ciao.